Okay. okay, we're going to begin. <laughs> Maybe. Um, does everyone have test RPC 4.0.1? Okay. Cool. If if you don't like, luckily, this is going to be more of like me doing a presentation for 30 minutes. We're going to talk like we're going to like talk about things, and then the rest of the time is going to be. Uh, like just free time hacking and I'll be walking around and Mike and we can help you out but it, it's mostly just like educational because this whole like slide code slide code is a little is a little difficult of a format um, if you do want to follow along like code as we go you you should either way pull this github from uh, github.com slash cmditch and, and if you want to type all this in or, or just go to my github and get hodl box or hodl box. We'll, we'll call it hodling. Does everyone know what hodling is? Okay, hodling is a meme uh, because somebody misspelled hold when the price of Bitcoin was crashing and he was just trying to say hold tight and he just spelled hodl instead. So now hodl is like just this uh, universal meme for like hold on because the prices are so crazy in cryptocurrency. So get my hodl box and uh, we get to go. Smart Contract 101, which Mike Pratt over there started out with us on. Uh, we went over Solidity and like the basic syntax and how to compile, how to use Truffle, uh, which is a, a develop DAP uh, development tool or framework. Well, today I'm going to more touch on maybe a little more advanced Solidity and uh, how to interface that with JavaScript and, and HTML and the web and make user interfaces. So the, the platonic ideal of a, of a good app is good code and, and, good, and a good user interface. So good back end, good front end, and you have good app. And uh, good testing, I didn't mention that. <laughs> but that's boring. But it's really important. <laughs> um, <laughs> So good, good code. I'm not gonna like go into all the design patterns, but like one of the most important ones is separating your logic so you don't uh, like get something like this, and your functions are just all like touching each other and groping one another, and it's very state gets very dirty, and we refer to this as spaghetti code. Don't do that. Um, I'll, I'll try to show you how, how not to do that. So. You, you probably all, how many of you heard of MVC or Model View Controller? Okay, so it's like a basic, there's a lot of MVCs out there. You have your model, which is your, your data or your state, your view, which is the, the user interface, and the controller, which is kind of the application logic, which intermediates between the, the state and the view. So in my HODL box, which I'll explain to you what it, the HODL box does, is you just put ETH in, and you uh, tell it how long you want it to hodl for in, in terms of blocks. And I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute, uh, live. And it will lock your ETH in this contract and you won't be able to withdraw it until a certain block is reached. So it's just a way to like force yourself to, it's like a, it's like a bomb that has no interest rate. <laughs> uh, and if the price of ETH crashes, then, <laughs> then you have a negative interest rate. Um, so the, this state, um, I guess true here is looking at the GitHub repository or the code as I speak. Okay, so in the JavaScript file, you'll see um, kind of like towards, more or less towards the bottom, there's an object called app state or window.appState. And it's, this is my model. And I'm just like putting very rudimentary type, like okay, contract address is gonna be a string, the balance is going to be an integer, and whatever this contract is will, will be an object, but I haven't, these are all just, like since JavaScript doesn't really have <laughs> types, <laughs> um, uh, you, since it doesn't, doesn't have strong typing, you, you just, I just am like loosely or weakly defining what the types are here, and, and the reader will have to infer. Is that too dark? Sorry. It's quite dark, but it, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, every people have to understand too. 
Uh, so like the contract is going to be an object. Uh, when I when I like define the contract later in the code, it's going to be applied to, to this app state object contract. The, the controller or the functions or the logic is in another object, which is at the very top of the JavaScript file called uh, app logic. And here we just have a bunch of functions. Um, like a, really, like this is where you s prevent spaghetti code. Like you you want to have like, not really small functions, but definitely not large functions. And uh, I'm not like a super uber coder, and I hack this uh, workshop up fairly quickly, so if my code sucks, um, just like throw tomatoes at me and stuff, and, and let me know what I should have done better. But, yeah, like, oh here, yeah, I'm gonna validate my form, I'll make a function for that, that's all it's gonna do. And then I'll have like, when I hit my button, it will do the submit form. And when I first start my application, I'll do the start app function. So you're like just separating all these, so you don't have like a giant procedural, just like mess of just one after the other. You just like have these nice little black boxes of functions. And other things you can have are like utility logic, which don't necessarily belong in the app state controller. It's, it's, uh, it's your choice, but it's arbitrary whether or not like, I have some utility, it's not actually an object in my file, but I just have some like basic functions which do things like show errors and log errors. And lastly, I have um, a contract object which actually has the ADI or the application binary interface, which is um, like which lets Web3.js know how to interact with the contract because otherwise the contract is just a, is binary. I, I mean, it's hexadecimal, but, but it's binary. It doesn't know how to, to like doesn't know what binary part matches up with like a human readable name that is the function name in Solidity. So like my function that, that you get your money out of the hodl box is called release the hodl. Like uh, release the kraken and reference there. Ha ha ha. And, <laughs> and so like it release the hodl is just hexadecimal in the bytecode. It's like hidden in there. So the ABI helps tell Web3.js, so you can actually like, type in JavaScript like my contract dot release the hollow, and that's what the ABI is doing for you. Um, the constructor is another part of a smart contract, which we went over last week, but it's like the, the values that you put in on the, the very beginning of the contract during its creation. So in this case, the, the, the argument that we're passing when we create the contract is, is the amount of hodling time, uh, the amount of blocks we want to hold for. And you can see you can see that in if you look in the contracts folder, uh, you can see the hollow box solidity contract, and you can see there's a function named capital H hollow box. That's your constructor function. It's, it's got to be the same name as the contract, and uh, yeah, and that's where we pass in the amount of blocks. I don't think I have the constructor as a part of my contract object in the JavaScript file because that's something defined in the form uh, of the user interface. All right, so that's some code stuff now, designing things. We should all like really strive to have beautiful interfaces, um, always. So like, this website is great. It's one of the most pleasant websites ever. It's probably given someone an epileptic, epileptic seizure at one point. This form is amazing. <laughs> I would, anyone with like seven PhDs might know how to fill that out. Um, the rest of them are just smashing their head against the wall. This is actually a beautiful form. <laughs> Here you'll have a chance to get my credit card number. Um, but just make sure you buy it or send it to my house because you want to buy something. But, Anywho, that, that, that's quite a nice form for many reasons. Um, that was an early revision of the HODL box. I redid some things, like there's just too much noise going on here. I mean, I'm not gonna get into like a UX spiel right now, but I just think it's really important. So you'll see, I'll show you right now what, what the actual final HODL box looks like. So this is it right now, it's live at uh, cmdigit. 
github.io slash homeworks. And the first thing you see when you, when you open it, and I'll actually, I'll, I'll paste that in, in this slide as well. General, just in case. So the, the first thing, that nice little UI feature is, uh, it's like, oh, where's the blockchain? Your R, you know, RPC is not found. Unfortunately, it only stays up for a few seconds because of how it programmed it, so that's not the UI. Um, you need to allow scripts in, so if you're running Chrome, it might be that you need to, there's a little shield up here. First, you have to start test RPC. Um, you know, I will, I will do that here. Yeah. This is not a local way by opening the file on your phone. What's that? So you can just open a local way by running opening the index file in Chrome without it just a connection to your local one and those scripts and stuff. Uh for for web three? Or for test RPC for mm -hmm. your app. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, um, regardless, it doesn't matter. See, that's the that's the cool thing is it's like a static application, and it's it's just HTML JavaScript. There's no interaction with any servers, except for the blockchain. And since I don't have test RPC running, which is my blockchain, it's it's failing right now. So if I go in here, I'm going to say test RPC, and one thing we have to do for this app is say dash b and we'll just say five, which means give it a five second block time. Otherwise, test RPC is just immediate. And in order for this app to like kind of do its magic, you, you need to give it a block time. Oops. And because I already have, yeah, that's fine. So then I'll reload this page and we should see my ETH balance go up and, and the error. Yeah, that's another thing that gotcha. MetaMask is kind of interesting to work with in test RPC. Oh, lovely. So this is the part where my... Um, Oh, no, no, here it is. Here's the shield part. Okay, cool. I'm getting hung up on what I already know. So, this is saying, oh, I can't connect to this. It's dangerous. Uh, GitHub is HTTPS, but you're trying to connect to test RPC because it's not HTTPS. So that, that's what this little shield up here is for. This, is, this will be useful if you're like developing locally and you're putting your stuff up on a secure site but you're trying to connect to test RPC, which is not technically secure. So then I'll say load more scripts and then bam, it works. Now I now it's seeing my ETH and, and everything's kosher. Um, is it, has anyone who's, who's trying this having issues currently or needs any assistance or putting Everyone is perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not okay, great. Uh, I still hear the positive that they're just trying to happen. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so another thing about this form is like there's form validation. Oh, the form's not filled out. That's good feedback. That's good UI. Um, there's there's zero values. Some you know maybe we don't want zero values. The the thing about the blockchain that's different from normal web programming is like you you can have your front Front end form validation, and then uh, in, in a normal web application, you would do you would also do validation on the server just to be sure, so you don't like put weird data in your database if someone wants to bypass your user interface. You, you can't really do that with the blockchain, so your all your validation has to occur on um, the front end. You be very strong and, and adamant and scrupulous about that. So that's the difference. I'm going to put uh, 42 ETH in for five blocks. 
That's another good UX is a little loading thing. Here's my transaction I went through, and then I get a response, and Mr. Hodor is holding hard, and I get a block. I get a block count. Oh, you, have, you can almost dehodl. This is actual. Like this is actually getting pulled from the chain. It's not just me manipulating text. So if I go and open a new tab. Uh, oh, there's the shield, blast the shield again. Boom, there's, there's the 58 ETH. So 42 of it is indeed holed up. And then I will. Of course, when the blocks were counting down. Yeah. What, what was causing that? Um, I had a set interval JavaScript function that calls. Um, a function on my contract, and it's it's a free call because you're not you don't need gas to get this data because um, you're not changing state on the blockchain you're just reading from it, and so that function is called uh, like hodling, remaining hodling or something like that. It, it's in the Solidity contract. You, you'll see it in the as one of the functions in the app app object as well. Um, so I'm just calling on an interval every like two seconds to get that data and then updating the UI accordingly. So it's basically just counting down. There's not something happening on the blockchain that's causing it to decrement? Nope. It is, well, I mean, other than the fact that the blockchain creates new blocks every 14 seconds, or in my case, every five seconds. Um, I mean, that's just a thing that's going to do that no matter what, regardless of my app. But I'm, Using that, you're reacting to that because I'm setting like, all right, I want to release. I, I don't want to release the hodl any time before the seven millionth block, okay. and so I'll be like, all right, in my uh, check hot check hodling time left function gets like, you know, whatever your block is minus the the current block number, and then it returns that number. Okay. Yeah. And then when everything's kosher, I change the UI, and if, when that value becomes zero, I say, okay, cool. UI put this release the hodl button in there that points to another function that then fires off a Web3 function that uh, indeed releases the hodl. More pending, loading, cool, spinnery, infinity UI goodness, and then phew, happy Hodor. Uh, good to go. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what is everything seem to be using Coinbase instead of just being test RPC addresses? Yeah, so Coinbase is um, your default. Um, Coinbase is not the company. Co the, the company got their name from this thing that blockchains use called the Coinbase, which is your default wallet, essentially, or the wallet that's like unlocked. And in the case of test RPC, the default Coinbase is like if count zero or something. Count zero. Well, they're all unlocked. Yeah, so like if we type here, web in the console, yeah. web3.eth.accounts, um, and this first account, and then I also type web3.eth.coinbase, and uh, yeah, there's the same, so you probably can't read that, 0xe875, 0x, we're just not using it. We could say web3.accounts7, but we're just using Coinbase as probably MetaMask that's relevant to developing MetaMask, which I This works with MetaMask on the main chain. Well, obviously, use it at your own risk. I don't know if there's any like, crazy DAO bugs in there. I don't think so. It's quite a simple contract. But... All right. Web3 gotchas. So we're dealing with a whole new programming environment, unlike anything we've seen before, except unless you work in uh, really, 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 uh, unless you work in banking with a 14.4K connection. Um, we're, we're dealing with something that has a lot of value and that has a lot of latency. In the case of Bitcoin, like 10 to 60 minute latency. In the case of Ethereum, 10 to, to 20 second latency. So that creates a lot of interesting problems for like user experience. You can, that's why you use like loading spinners and pending, and like people are going to be waiting around until this speeds up and, and we uh, 
uh, this technology gets better. The high latency, yeah, you know, like I just said, uh, spinners and, and just letting the user know. And the high value, that's where form validation becomes very important and checking, um, like lots of checking, like when I was checking to see how much hodling time was left. Um, and, but in the case of value, there, there could, you could conceivably have a transaction that gets uh, blasted out to the, to the network and it just uh, it fails. Like in Ethereum, you can get this out of gas error thing. And there's no, there's no like response in Web3 that I know of that lets you know that you're, that you got this out of gas error. Correct me if I'm, correct me if I'm nervous. I think you can get something in there. Like yeah. A, like a transaction. Uh... Okay, so what you do get right away is a transaction ID, which is like the hash and all based on whatever transaction you're making. Um, but you then have to, you then have to checking or confirmation logic. So that's what brings me to this slide. So you get a transaction hash back when you, uh, like when I make my hollow locks and I do that transaction, and it gives me a transaction ID, and then in the JavaScript further, you have to like, maybe you have a set interval function which every two, every one second does a web.web3.eth.get transaction receipt, which is a pretty important function in Web3. And then you would type in the, the transaction hash or transaction ID in there. And you'll get this object back, either you'll get no object back, which means it failed for sure, or <laughs> like it won't have a contract address, that probably means it failed, um, or the block just hasn't been confirmed. But an interesting um, little hack that I saw someone mention in, in, in the Ethereum docs was like, if the gas you sent into the contract, which you know because you define that in, in your code, you can see it in my JavaScript file on that um, like right below the start app function, there's like the deploy contract function in it, and I define the gas, and I think it's like two million or something. There's no way I'm going to run out. But if the gas that you sent in was the same amount of gas used, you'll see a gas used um, field in this get transaction receipt object. Uh, it probably means that it failed, it ran out of gas, which is not <laughs> it's not 100% sure check, it's kind of hacky, um, but that's just something to like know you can use, and it's, Mike, do you have anything to, No. It, yeah, like, it's yeah. super hacky, but I, I know what you're saying, like it's definitely not user friendly, like when something fails, yep. like you have to know what to look for, yep. but I don't remember like specifically what it was. Yeah, and so like, definitely the reason, the reason why is like you're almost always sending more gas than it's going to use, just in case, and then you'll get what you'll get returned back to you whatever you don't use. So just send more, and and the likelihood of it using the exact amount of gas that you sent is it's probably low. So just remember that as like a tool, because as it stands, you don't get messages thrown back at you when something fails, and for a good reason, um, because it, you, could, you could DOS the network. You could just send one gas transactions, and the, the nodes would have to like work them, and then they would have to be sending all these clients a bunch of messages, and it would just get kind of messy. Okay. Um, if you open up the HODL box contract, we're gonna do a little bit of like, just a small amount of line by line to talk about some of the, some of the things that are occurring here. So um, on line 17 and, and 25, actually I'll, I'll bring up the code in here. Bigger. 
All right. Um, payable functions. This is like well, this used to not exist, but now you have to define um, if, if if you're going to be sending ETH into a function, you need to put this payable modifier on there. It's like a native uh, word in Solidity. Who knows what those are called? I, that was the wrong way to put it. A native reserved, word. Reserved word. Reserved. Yeah, reserved. Yeah. It's like a, it's like you int or event. Mm -hmm. Things that you can't you can't call your function event or you can't call a variable. Event. <laughs> um, authorization. So lines eighteen and, and thirty two. It's like here I'm setting whoever makes the contract is now the hodler. And then on line 32, if I want to release it, I'm saying, hey, if you're not what was defined as hodler when this contract was made, if the person interacting with this contract is not the person who created the contract, then throw an error and don't allow this function to go through. Um, uh, ledger light, so... It's just like this hobbling variable is, is just like a little micro ledger within the contract. So this is, this is how all um, tokens work on Ethereum. You, they're just like little mini ledgers inside of a contract and you're, you're, you're like updating integers uh, in, in the contract. It's kind of interesting, it's, like it's that simple. So like this is just a number and it's kind of my one number ledger and I'm saying whatever whatever ether was sent into the contract during its creation, well, that's what my number is. And then um, if I want to deposit more ether into that, then I'll just like later on, then I can up that number there. And then at the very end, uh, I'm going to say uh, make that zero, which actually isn't necessary because of the way I changed the code and used the struct function. We'll get into that. So, so just before I move on from that, like this idea of using the internal state, like maybe that micro ledger ledger like concept can. If you go look at token contracts, like the ERC twenty token contract, it's it's really that. Simple. They just have like a map record saying, like, oh, this address has this many tokens, and they just have a whole list of addresses and integers that tell that are stored in the contract, saying how many tokens they have. And then there's other functions in that contract that are like, oh, if I want to transfer tokens, then it's just going to call some function that like decrements that person's uh, amount of tokens, so that person's integer or tokens they hold to a new address or an, an existing address's uh, integer in that record. That's like all it is. So, so who, um, like, a, uh, who here is programmed in Ruby? Or, or, yeah, so like a like a hash in Ruby. It's just like your address is the is the key, and the money held is the value. Uh, throws are really like used quite often, as we can see. Um, like especially on, on this one, so it's like the whole logic of the app, you know, the holding part is right here. Like if the block number is less than whatever the hollow block number is, then just don't allow that contract to be called. All right, who here is familiar? Oh, sorry. So when you throw, uh, it ends the current transaction, and I think it also consumes all the gas. Oh, so it's, it's kind of like a punishment. To the caller, okay. To not to, so to disincentivize. Yeah. That. Otherwise, you, it's another like DOS vector oh. potentially denial of service vector. Uh, who, who here is familiar with events? This is like a very important. Yeah. So if events in Solidity are are in Ethereum are uh, these things I defined up here and. Using Web3, you can watch for an event. So if I love that, and then for watch. Hmm. watch 
So here, here we have, this is um, in, within my app state, I have my contract, which is just called the deployed, hollow box deployed, which is like that particular contract because you can have a million hollow boxes, but you need to define like which one you want to interact with at a particular address and it's stored in this. And then because of the ABI, I can then have all these functions and one of them is this event, which is called hollow released. And I assign the hollow released and I'm looking for uh, this particular value that's coming from that event and only if it's true. So only if it's true, uh, then you run this function called dot watch on it and it's, uh, it's like a callback function. So the, the minute the, the blockchain emits that data and, it, and then that um, value that I'm looking for here is released. If it's false, which it can never be in my contract, uh, it, I won't, this watch event won't fire off. But if it is true, it will fire off and then do all this app logic. So, the way that's implemented in Solidity is you just define the event and then what things are, like what values are in that event, in this case just a boolean. Sometimes you'll have events like, uh, you'll have something that's an address, like an account or uh, and a value, and they'll have like multiple things. You can you can index the events to to make the calls go a little bit faster. Um, and then at the bottom, when I do the release the hodl, there it is. Like that's how you send an event out. You just have the event name, and then you know it could be false that's in there. If I put false in there and recompiled it and, and ran my code, it, my UI would not update because it's only looking for true events. Does anyone have any questions on events? They're quite important for UI work. Can't seem to get them to call from tests. It okay. Just always says uh, there's no events registered. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look into that more and uh, maybe we'll chat on Slack and figure out what's going on there. Uh, super question, but um, <laughs> I'm a back end guy, so that is a really stupid question. Yeah, Next. All right. <laughs> I don't do a lot about okay, anyway, long story short, uh, just a quick console log. Can you just use that for a debug? Because I've read today that there was some kind of um, callback mechanism that I should uh, become familiar with when it comes to logging and debugging. debugging as well. So you're saying don't use call? You shouldn't no, use No, no, I'm, I'm asking, should I? I don't know. Oh. Well, so I, it's delayed, but I've got like, like the JavaScript. Can do console log to the entire yeah. Solidity files don't know what it is. So okay. Solidity, the only output you get is for events. It's the only way you know what's going on in the contract at all. Yeah, so how do you, what's it? Yeah, so you use you events. Yeah, console logging is very uh, useful for debugging. Also, another thing I'll do is fire up, uh, I'll open a new terminal. I mean, you can work You can work in the console and use Web3, or you can just open up a term, terminal, uh, open node, uh, import Web3 and just work in that node term. It's no different than working in the browser console. And then I'll interact directly with like web 3 get transaction receipt and I'll debug it that way too. So just, you, you kind of have to like log things, but you also have to interact with it to, to be sure uh, that things occurred as well. But, I mean, yeah, like console.log is, is your best friend. Uh, well, there was another question about events maybe? No? Okay. Um, so the, there's a, I'm not going to really go over a lot right now, but in, another thing about events is you, there's this indexable thing. So like my event is really simple; it's just a boolean. Um, but oftentimes you'll see events that that are saying like let's say you have a decentralized exchange like Ether Delta. Has anyone here used Ether Delta? It's super cool. So so the event will be like uh, let's say you open up your Ether Delta and the watch event is only going to watch for events that happen under your your like MetaMask address, and so there's going to be tons of events happening on Ether Delta because it's an exchange. But it's only going to fire off like when you do dot watch. It's only going to do events that match your address. So that's a really like handy way to like my hollow box. <laughs> like you're the only one interacting with it. But if you have an application that tons of people are interacting with, you need a way to like filter those events and 
that's where um, that's where these things you're gonna have like many, 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 many things you're passing to an event, like your address, your amount, a block time, blah, 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 a ton of things. And then on the client side, you can filter specifically, or you can not filter at all, you just watch all of those. So is the, is the line you have highlighted there settle, setting that event to true, or is it throwing the Boolean true value yep. through? It's throwing true, so right after I could put hot release to false, and it would throw both. Okay. Yeah. And that's why you can kind of reuse the same contract and it's you know you set it exactly so yeah. Uh, constants are like things that don't change the state, so you don't have to like send gas and, and do all the crazy consensus that the blockchain does because you're just reading from the blockchain and anyone can download the blockchain. So constants are free, and here um, that's where we have these functions like my Hodl countdown is a constant because it's just reading. There's no, there's no blockchain state mutation. It's just like doing a little bit of math and then returning the Hodl count. Um, they're pure functions. If anyone here is into functional programming, that word gets me uh, real aroused. <laughs> Arousal is almost never bad. Um, <clears throat> Self-destruct, self-destruct, where are you at? Okay, self-destruct, I used to have like a quirky logic in here that like decremented the ho the hodling, it like set a variable to, you know, to some weird stuff, like basically prevented the DAO, what, what, what the problem with the DAO hack was, was they, they sent the money and then updated the balance in the local contract state. You need to do it the other way around, you need to update the balance and then send the money because of how Contract interactions, like if if, a, if you send money to someone, they can they can have a function that when they receive money, then calls back to the contract and calls the same function and just puts it in a loop. And if you're if you don't have any logic saying, hey, look, if your if your uh, balance is zero, then I won't allow you to to withdraw anymore. Well, if you don't update the balance until after the send transaction, you can get this reentrancy bug, which is how the DAO. Failed. So instead of like having all that logic I had previously in here, I actually use this self-destruct uh, thing that's very important to the blockchain and in you know solidity keyword. Um, and then the argument you pass into self-destruct is, is any ether that's in the contract is going to be returned to this person. Um, so if it's no ether, then whatever. But like that's a required thing because. You don't know whether or not a contract's going to have ether, and you can't just blow up a contract and destroy ether. It has to go somewhere. The benefit of destructing a contract is it saves the, there's kind of like two, two states, more or less, in Ethereum. There's the entire blockchain state, the entire history, and then there's like the working, act, like this current important working state. Because all kinds of stuff could happen in the history, but like things are changing and things are changing, and like now you have like, the most important the state that you're reading from and manipulating. Um, this is where like, state tree pruning comes in. You might hear that talked about. Um, so self-destruct is healthy for the blockchain, and everyone should clean up after themselves. And that's how you clean up after yourself on the blockchain. Otherwise, you could just have a bunch of like stagnant state on the chain, and it's just not good for the. I think there's economic incentives to using this too. Um, I Still looking into that, but there's like, there's, yeah, there should be an incentive to use, to clean up after yourself, basically. It used to be called suicide as well, in case anyone's wondering. Um, okay, yeah. What does that do? So it destroys your contact once it's executed. It it basically tells all the nodes that you don't need to hold this contract in like work in your memory. Like maybe if you're a node and you're caching a bunch of the state in your memory, well, it's gonna tell that node like, yeah, no one's ever gonna work with this contract again, so you don't have to put that in your memory. Or it tells the light clients, or the state pruning clients, that they don't even have to download that contract when they initialize the blockchain. That specific instance of the contract, or, or like the person- No, that's a specific instance. So that, yeah. 
It's the specific instance. It's not the meaning of the contract. Well, all contracts are specific instances. So you're like contract factory, which is like the byte code, and mm -hmm. and uh, that you know doesn't really doesn't live on a blockchain per se. That's just like ab abstract. And you can instantiate out of that factory as many contracts of that type as you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, we're going to kind of roll through these because we should get to some coding and having fun and me talking less. Uh, the, the Web3 initialization, so now we're looking at the JavaScript file and not the Slytherin file. So on line uh, 184, we, at the very bottom, I have this thing in here which is like a very common piece of JavaScript you'll see. Uh, I didn't write it, I just like pasted it in there more or less, and then at the very end, it's like checking whether or not Web3 is there, it's providing some, like if it's not there, um, I can do some logging, and then at the very end of that, when we know we more or less have Web3, I'm starting, I'm doing my, my controller of my start app function, and like getting me started. And I put it, I wrapped it in a set timeout because I noticed some errors, my app is really light, and and uh, Web three like even though it was it was like called and, and, and getting imported it wasn't done running through all the JavaScript and there was a race condition so my app was failing intermittently failing so I just wrapped it in a little timeout to let Web three load that's like pretty useful for really light um, gaps so remember that so. Um, I load the page, I see the no web three, you should consider trying that mask message. Yep. Because yeah, um be, because I think it's expecting Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I'm loading web three because I just copied this and like didn't really edit it, just I yeah, you're gonna get that error, you know, it's not true. This is not true. <laughs> um and then I'm doing a little like Web3 check myself. So yeah, like it, I should have not called it Web3 check, I should call it like blockchain check. So Web3 is the library, that, the JavaScript library, but like this Web3 check is checking your connection to the blockchain. And if you don't have a test RPC running, you'll see that other error we saw earlier um, that pops down okay. in the UI. That actual, fun that function is being called in a few different places, but it's actually just defined right here in a try catch. So it's saying, hey, if, and I'm just using the Coinbase, like, because it's a super simple uh, synchronous, not an asynchronous call that you can make to Web3. If, if, you, if you find an address, put it in the console, if, and then if you don't, if there's an error, then display this error, but catch it, don't fail the whole app. So, so my, web, my blockchain check, which that should actually be called, is it wrapped in a try catch. Um, I already talked about the delay because my app is really light. And then the DAP initiation, the start app um, function is the very first function in my controller and it's checking for Web3. It's, gonna, it's going to set the Coinbase address in my model and also the contract um, factory, not the actual contract instance, but the contract factory, which uses this Web3 function and all you pass into it is the API. And then finally, I'll run the next function, which is a, get, get my balance, basically, put that on the UI. How are you telling it to check the local test RPC and not like, the actual blockchain? Um, to prevent your problem. I mean, <laughs> think that's a bad code that you copied and pasted. Yeah, that that is. Is. Yeah, so right, right here, it's saying like, ba else, Web3 equals this. Yeah. Ah. Yep. Okay. So it'll look for the regular blockchain first, when it doesn't find it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just arbitrary. Like, this is just, like, you could put in here anything you want or nothing at all and have the UI do something else. It's, this is just so I can, like, switch between the real blockchain and my test quite easily. And I use, I'm, like, using MetaMask and disabling it it just allows a nicer like testing and developer experience. So are there local providers that provide this? Yeah, so like any window to the blockchain that 
you know, like hardly any of us probably have a full moon because uh, I have a laptop and I should have a full moon. But, and I, I'll like wipe the note on the laptop and get a new one. Uh, but like when you go to my Ether wallet, they're pointing to a whole host of, of nodes using, um, and same, same with all block explorers. You know, they, they have like a bunch of nodes and they're all load balanced because they're getting a ton of requests. So they're, so yeah, so those would be running everybody's DAP that they're trying to interact with, but then the actual node itself gets written to only like either changing hands or like what actually gets written to the node of the node. Since you know if you're interacting with total, you're not doing that on the blockchain, you may total level. Of you are. So if I if I if like that little countdown timer I had, like if I was on the real chain and I was using MetaMask. MetaMask would intercept that function call and they would call out to one of their uh, full node, their host of full nodes, and they're using a, uh, various number of services out there. Like Microsoft Azure has a thing, uh, Infura is another company that you can fire up full nodes on, but Web, uh, MetaMask has their own set of full nodes, and they're, even though I'm not right into the blockchain, that data is still coming from a full node somewhere because it can't come from a browser. Like, I don't have. All of the blockchain in my browser. Are full our nodes uh, rewarded anyhow? Like, anyway, like miners? Mm -hmm. um, not from calls, no. but from writing the blockchain, they get transaction fees. Okay. Yeah, they get the gas, and then and then they're mining. Uh, if you're a mining node, so if you're not a mining node, yeah, what incentivizes no? A, a non -mining but the node. thing that incentivizes non-mining full nodes is that they're trying to. They have a product, you know, MetaMask has a product. You might not pay for it, but um, same with Jax. Jax is pointing to full nodes. Jax has, they, wallets have an interesting revenue model. Um, we won't really get into what that is right now. I mean, maybe later we can talk about that. But like, they, they, it's in their interest to, to provide you a window to, to a node. So I'm kind of wondering, maybe I like, can answer too, uh, is there a way to make a, like a full node mining machine enforce a contract that was written by, say, the owner of the machine? What do you mean by that? So, going from like proof of work, proof of stake, and all that kind of stuff, but what if I write a contract, a crappy one, but it does serve some sort of conveyance, utility, logic, purpose, and then my computer, which is always mining a 26 mega hash, is just focused on that contract? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, but then your node will, um, your, because you're only focused on that contract, you're only going to produce a block. You're only going to mine a block that has that contract in it, and then that block will be out of consensus with all the other blocks, and your node will get kicked off and start its own chain. So it will fall out of consensus. Okay. So you can reorder. I think you can give certain uh, transactions priority, which has been a problem with doing with these ICOs. We'll see uh, mining operations that like prioritize their transactions first. Uh, but you can't actually like remove or add transactions because then you'll get out of consensus. Okay. Um, form validation that's in there. You can pull up these slides and look at the lines if you really care. Other really useful functions are two-way and from way. So so like you noticed in Solidity we're defining the hodling amount as an integer. Well, in my DAP, it's a float. You know, it's like eight, it could be like 8.6 or whatever. Well, that's not an integer. That's because we're only dealing in way, which is the lowest uh, amount. Uh, it's like a Satoshi. It's like the Ethereum's equivalent to a Satoshi, which is the smallest increment of Bitcoin that you can send, you know, all the way to the like eighth decimal. So that you, we can kind of guarantee you just be working in integers. And you don't, the, the thing, but since we don't want to read our account balance in a way, like, oh, I have like 17 bajillion trillion way, yo. Like, I'm a millionaire. Like, I don't know. Like, no, we deal in Ether or Bitcoin. So we, we use two-way and from-way functions to just help do really fast conversions for us. Uh, error display, a uh, little like actual UI pop down, not just logging the error, um, is in there, as we noticed earlier. And then the set interval and, and set timeouts are like really important JavaScript functions for, because we're dealing with a very, like I said, high latency system. So set interval, uh, we'll watch, you know, like you, each one of these you pass in two arguments. The first is a function that you want to call, and the second is the time in milliseconds that you want to uh, 
either call it once for in the case of set timeout or call it on an interval for. And if you write this, uh, you, it would be in your interest to also do a, uh, I don't know what the fun, it's in my code somewhere, but it's like stopping, stopping this loop. Once some condition is met, you then stop the, you know, the interval. All right, now it's time for the rest of the class. Uh, we can code and ask questions and talk. So um, here's some ideas that I had, like my like improvements that could be made to hollow blocks is like the placeholder, like it's a really simple UI improvement, like placeholders inside of a text box are confusing. They're not uh, necessarily the best user interface choice because Because uh, here we've got value and ETH, time talk. Well, if I like, type some stuff in and then like do other things in my life and come back to it, I like don't know what those are. So that's a pretty rudimentary uh, user user experience thing. Like, oh, what? Which one is which? I forgot. And then you have to like delete it. And oh, okay, it blocks. So you can change that. Uh, that's pretty boring, but it's up to you. More interesting one is uh, <clears throat> uh, um, if we refresh my page, we lose the contract. So we lose that instance. So if I send, like I have 100 ETH right now, if I send, if I want to hold uh, 12 ETH, let that go through. Well, if I like, my computer crashes or I refresh the page, uh, I've like basically lost, like unless I remember that contract address and I, maybe I can, and there's a way to find the contract, it's on the blockchain, and you can reference your address in the block explorer. But like the, the, use, the, the user interface is like lacking a lot here, where, oh shoot, it should know that I've already, I'm already holding, hodling something. And so the way we can solve that is by, um, well, I'll get into that in the next slide here. This is the last one. Lastly, the co this contract is expensive. So, in its very single purpose, it's like all of the stuff is happening on the instantiation of the contract, and then there's one function that destroys the contract. So, there's like state creation and destruction, and like a lot of gas is being used for the creating contract. You could make a contract that um, is like a global or public, it's like a public hollow box, you know. It's, uh, it's like a public good. So instead of anyone who interacts with the contract would get like popped in a map and their value adjusted accordingly, and it would just the contract would live forever. And and you could define um, like anyone could call a function that says I want to hold for ten blocks, and then send some Ethereum with that function call, and they'll and then they'll be hot on you. And the contract can keep track of like a million different hodlers and the contract could just live forever. And actually, uh, so I wrote that contract, that version of the contract up. It's on a different, um, I shouldn't tell you this now because we haven't gotten to it. It's on, a, it's on a different branch in the GitHub. I think it's called like, I forget what it's called. But it's in there. So that, that logic is actually incredibly simple. So creating this as like a publicly usable contract is very simple. And it uses a lot less gas for people because of that. Because function calls are much cheaper than creating contracts. Uh, all right, and here, here's a little more detail on each one of those. You can choose, like, you can do whatever you want and, and you just talk or whatever, but these are just some interesting ways to improve the, the contract. As far as the, the page refreshing portion goes, you could use um, this thing if you, if you open up the JavaScript console, local storage is like a browser, native browser function, functionality, and local storage dot set item, and then some key and some value, and then get item for the key, or maybe remove item at that key. So you could, on the, on the deploying of the contract, set the contract's address in your local storage, and if you close your browser or refresh the page, or do whatever, barring throwing your computer in the trash. Uh, this will always come back up when you go to the website, as long as you haven't removed it. 
and you can check for that on the start of the application. If anything is at, if local search at get item, my con, uh, anything at this key, which is just a string, you, the key can be whatever string you want. Uh, if there's something there, then cool. We know to do, we know how to like handle the app from now. We'll like let them interact with their previous huddle box. If there's not, then let them create a new huddle box. That kind of stuff. So, does that make sense? I mean, that's quite simple enough, but I, I feel like that's really important because when I refresh the huddle box, you lose your ETH. So the, the local source is on the browser? Yeah, it's within the browser. Yeah. So I'll, do, I'll just show like, an example really quick. Um, I think it's really cool. It's similar to cookies. You could also use cookies. Cookies is like a, another form of local storage, but, but uh, this is much more pleasant to interact with. Oops. This What's is that newer cookies? Or? What's that? This is newer cookies? It is. It is newer. So here we're like local storage dot set. And all browsers support this. Um, yeah, I think, I, th I mean, I think, I think at this point, safe to say, I might be wrong, so maybe cookies are like the better choice, and I'm just a fan of like doing the latest and greatest. Uh, test, and then, bam, and then if we do local storage dot, Get item test. There it is. So, uh, and the actual like seeing that um, application in at least within Chrome is right here. Storage uh, in one of these many things. All the way up. Test. So clearly, it's got to be supported because. Google Slides is very heavily using uh, local storage. So, as it's like a little micro database. And that's it. So now, uh, if anyone wants to take it upon themselves to work with the HTML JavaScript and Solidity that's in the GitHub repo and change it around and make these improvements or make whatever improvements you want, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, now, before we like cut the video completely, does anyone does anyone want to talk about anything or have any questions? Um, local storage. Um, Creating like a globally accessible hollow box that kind of do that. Yeah. So, from my perspective, I'm always looking at like how can I do what these big industries are doing. And like you heard of the Ryzen network on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like I thought, why don't we make a thing where we basically be that? I mean, what what else can be done other than an extra service? So, uh, or how can we modify this extra service to something novel? To to say what? To do something just different. Yeah. So that was going to be my uh, recommendation for the hackathon. Is like <laughs> like. <laughs> An escrow service is really as simple as it gets on the blockchain. Like, oh, hold, like, it's a very simple type of application. It's incredibly boring. So make an escrow service that's interesting. Um, Hodlebox is like slightly less boring, but it's basically just a time-based escrow. You could have another escrow that requires the signature of another node address or group of addresses. Um, but like, as far as the hackathon goes, um, You'll be judged on like novelty. Um, I'll judge you on humor because I'm uh, <laughs> I like humor. <laughs> uh, if you're really funny, it doesn't mean you're gonna win. Like if your code sucks or if it's just like really boring. If it's really funny, like, you're probably gonna win. Um, I have some really good i or I have a really interesting idea in my opinion that involves uh, postal. The like postal service and using like smart contracts QR codes and sending ETH as as a form of postage stamp and then having the receiver do some function call on that QR code contract when they receive the package and it would release the ETH 
in the postage stamp to the postal company. I just told you like my idea for the, for the hackathon. Um, steal it, I guess, <laughs> and see how you can judge. Uh, <laughs> but like that's an, that's an example of like a cool, like a novel escrow. Like it's not just escrow, it has like real world application. Because otherwise escrow is just like, I don't know, make a drink. What kind, of, what kind of flavor of drink do you want to make? It's very just a template to work with. I don't know, Sasha came up, I think you had a group of people come up with the escrow idea at the, one of yeah. the first meetups? Yeah. yeah, so we had a little planning session before we picked this up. Cool. The yeah, idea was like, what can we create in six hours? It's not, they utilize the blockchain that isn't too digital. Yeah, if we did something more than something that simple, we would be looking at like a two-day hackathon or something. Because a lot of hackathons are, you know, one to two days. We have a very relatively short hackathon. All right, so I encourage you to make, um, I would really be curious in the remainder of this tonight's workshop to see someone implement the page refresh like, I haven't done that yet, and I, I think that would be cool. It might be a little ambitious, but at least to put like the basic logic in place. And then also the, the globally accessible hotbox, that's more like, this is more like UI oriented, and this is more like back end, like how do we restructure the Solidity contract itself. Um, and then this one is just incredibly banal, um, but don't, don't let that deter you, because it's important for your users to have a good experience. And, and I'll leave it at that. So if anyone has any questions uh, regarding solidity or you know development stuff, then Mike and I will be walking around and, and that's that. So we can talk to the live stream.